अनभिप्रेतम आपन्न प्रत्याख्यातुम अनिश्वर परचंदम न विदुषा पुष्यमानो जनेन सा अनभिप्रेता मापन्ना प्रत्याख्यातुम अनिश्वर परचंदम न विदुषा पुष्यमानो जनेन सा अनभिप्रेता मापन्ना प्रत्याख्यातुम अनिश्वर पुष्यमानो जनेन सा अनाभिप्रेतम आपन्ना प्रत्याख्यातुम अनिश्वर परचंदम न विदुषा पुष्यमानो जनेन सा अनभिप्रेतम आपन्ना Okay, so this is actually uh, quite a few Sanskrit words in there that have come into English in that shloka, but I won't bore you with that stuff today. I think you already get a handful of aspirins when you come to my Bhagavatam classes. So I don't want to bore you to death, but there's quite a few words in that Sanskrit verses that I can show you have come, made their way into English, Europe, German, Spanish. Um, I'll just give you one example. Vidusha, Vidusha. Vidusha comes into English as uh, video, vision, witty, all these words to know wisdom, all these words to do with visions, videos, comes from the Sanskrit word Vidusha, Veda, Vidusha. So th that's just one example, I can go forever. Um, linguistics are interesting. So, after, let's uh, call and response. After coming out of the abdomen, the child is given to the care of persons who are unable to understand what he wants and thus he is nursed by such persons unable to refuse whatever he is given to him he falls into undesirable circumstances within the abdomen of the mother the nourishment of the child was being carried on by nature's own arrangement the atmosphere within the abdomen was not at all pleasing, but as far as the child's feeling was concerned, it was being properly done by the laws of nature. But upon coming out of the abdomen, the child falls into a different atmosphere. He wants to eat one thing, but something else is given to him, because no one knows his actual demand, and he cannot refuse the undesirables given to him. Sometimes the child cries for the mother's breast, but because the nurse thinks it is due to pain within his stomach that is crying, she supplies with him some bitter medicine. Child does not want it, but he cannot refuse it. 
He is put into a very awkward circumstances and the suffering continues. Um, just reflect, it just makes me reflect my own childhood. I was unfortunately growing up in a, in a village, in a town, which was kind of a retreat for a whole mafia of the state politics. So it was unfortunate, obviously I didn't choose that circumstance. But the whole the town that I was living was a retreat, like all the political mafias and everybody, whatever they had to do, all the crimes and whatever they had to do, they would come to this town to hide and retreat. And uh, unfortunately, my maternal uncle, my mother's dad, uh, my mother's brother, was one of the kingpin. And um, my mother gladly, after he came, he came after his all his whatever funny fun things he was doing. <laughs> so he comes to my home and to see like my my sister had a child, my sister had another male child. I want to see. And he comes running after, running into my house. I remember I was about maybe two years, I just glimpsely remember the figures. And I remember him coming into the house and then he says, sister, and my mother said, brother, you got another son. Good on you. I need more sons, more sons the better because he was into all this. And the first thing is he picks out his gun, like automatic, and he puts it into my hand. And he says, son, try to hold it. And I'm like, maybe two and a half years or something, and I cried and I threw the gun. And, and my uncle looked at my mother, said, what a shameful son. <laughs> Why did you give birth to this? This guy is a chicken. <laughs> I just threw it away and then he just kept uh, doing it for a long time. He tried to train me for, for a very long time. Anyway, until I was matured enough and I escaped and I ran away from home. That's, uh, that's past. So it was just, I was just reflecting how children are given things uh, that are, may not be their nature. There's something else that they want but they're trying to impose. So, what, Kapil, what is Kapil Muni doing? We, I, as you know, what I try to do when I'm reading Bhagavatam or Vedas or Vedic literature or Puranas or Shrutis or Shrutis or Sutras or Brahma Sutra, what I try to do is I try to always find a language and semantics and vernacular that goes around the planet currently so that I can connect when I'm doing my books, when I'm on Sankirtan, I can connect to the people, I can connect to, to the societies and communities. So they actually understand that we are not some people coming out from Ilavrita Varsha or something. We, we belong to this planet. And I, I found after, after a long time that it's going to be extremely hard if people don't understand what on God's planet I'm talking about. So I made it my mission that I had to find vernaculars, I had to find semantics, I had to find the academics, I had to find a platform of language where people will look at me and think I'm a normal person. I want to be like him. Not when they see me, oh my God. All good, good culture, good show, but not for me. I always saw that initially, that every time when people saw it, nice book, nice language, beautiful philosophy, but not for me. I heard that again and again, thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And I thought, mm, no, this is not justice. To Prabhupada. So that I, I made it my mission. I said, I'm going to find, I'm going to find a language. I'm going to train in academics. 
I am going to start from the scratch. Find common grounds. People can relate to me because that's exactly what Vyasadev does for his times. That's exactly what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does for his times. That's exactly what Prabhupada does for his times. So we're going to have to do something for our times. So when people see us, when people talk to us, they're not alienated. They don't feel alienated. We don't leave them in the deep end. So, what is um, Kapilamuni trying to do? What Kapilamuni is trying to do, it's called, he's talking about what's called inconvenient truths. This is a very inconvenient part of Bhagavatam. We are all very worried since the self-esteem movement took off in 1970s or 80s. That was in America, in the West Coast. Actually, even before uh, Hare Krishna movement came, I mean, Iskon. Hare Krishna movement was always there. I mean to say Iskon. So, even before this, what, what came to be known as was the self-esteem movement. And in the self-esteem movement, it became kind of a world ethos that always talk things that are bubbly, things everybody likes to hear. Hari Bol! Jai! Everybody want to hear this? Okay, let's talk about this. So only convenient thing, because what? Oh my God, if you say something inconvenient, oh my God, we're going to... You don't hurt their self-esteem. Oh my God. No. The worst thing that you can do is to dent their ahankar. Protect their ahankar. Put them in their, you know, in that nitrogen uh, storages. But no. No. Kapiyamani is saying, let's talk some inconvenient truth. What is our situation? Let's start from scratch. What is our situation? So he, in the last earlier part of this chapter, he spoke a lot about the inconvenient situation that we were, the predicaments that we were in a mother's womb. Very inconvenient truth. Because these days, you know, the cover of the, 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 the reality by all the baby showers and this showers and that showers, and then my wife's uh, cousin, she, she started this um, party business. And she sends this photograph of all the baby showers that she does. And you look at it and you, you think like the angel has just come. The planet is going to be saved now. Because all the flowers, all the pinky stuff and the purple. And, and, um, and you look at the photographs and you go, oh, damn. Now the planet will be saved. And I'm, wait a minute, there's something going on here. Because we are so, it's become such a Vaishya culture. The planet has been taken by market share and consumptions. And when a, pla a whole planet is taken by a market share and consumptions. When Prabhupada talks about establishing Varnashrama Dharma, he's not talking about bringing Indian caste system into here. He's talking about balancing people's propensities. If someone wants to be a teacher, he's a Brahmana. End of story. It's not so esoteric. If someone likes to mobilize function economies, mobilize economies, find market shares, Vaishya. Some is a protector, controller, wants to get things done. Easy peasy. Kshatriya. Oh, just, just tell me what to do. Okay, just tell me what to do. Don't ask me to start projects. Just tell me what to do. Shudra. Simple as that. We, we need everybody. So, what did I say? Where, where, where did I come to this part? Okay, that's fine. So, what Kapilamuni is trying to do is he's trying to bring up some inconvenient truths. Facing our problems. Yeah, that was what I was trying to say. <coughs> when I was saying balance, 
what happens is now if you see the current world it has been completely taken over by kind of vaishya mentality market shares consumptions market shares industrialized market share consumption industrialized market share consumption jai radha krishna bhagwan ki so industrialized market share consumption industrialized market share consumption is that what you see everybody do and i'm just making things up is that how we program because one particular mentality has taken over this planet when Prabhupada says establishing back divine Varnashrama system, he doesn't he doesn't mean to bring like you know, oh Ramadhabu, Namidambu, na you know the Brahmanas from the you know South Indian temples, oh na, oh na, mudat chete. You don't understand Sanskrit. Get the hell out of here. No, that's not what Prabhupada means. Prabhupada means balancing, have a good balance of teachers, good balance of people who are contemplative, reflective, scriptural people. Good balance of people who can mobilize economies. Good balance of people who are willing to protect, protect the man, protect the old man, protect children, protect rights, protect other dharmas. You understand? And then there has to be the balance of simple shudra, simple people. Just tell me what to do. That's what he means. So that is what's going on. Inconvenient truth. We need to face. We need to be able to talk in convenient truth. So let's go. If you th- just in case you're thinking like Radhika Prasad never talks about the words, I'll just come back to the words. <coughs> but before that, I'll give you a background. Let's go to the Bhagavatam series of just quick Bhagavatam recap of speeches. Just go to one of some of the main speeches, not all of it, just some of the main speeches. What happens when Vyasadeva comes to Narada Muni, first encounter of Vyasadeva and Narada Muni? He talks very inconvenient truth. The first question, is that a question you ask when you meet someone like Vyasadeva? Come on. He says, do you identify, the problem is, do you identify yourself with your body, mind, intellect or is there anything else can we go through this step by step or have you done this have you assessed this correctly very inconvenient to listen to someone like Vyasadeva he's the archetypes of professors he started what you call he started the culture of what you call a professor let's move on Dhruva Maharaj. He's very angry, he wants to go to the forest, he wants to be in a kingdom like his father, equal to Brahma. What does Naraduni do when he comes? Very inconvenient truth. What are you doing? You're a little boy, you should be playing. You should be playing with other children. What are you doing? No, I'm going to Tapasya. <laughs> yeah, as if. Tapasya. Very inconvenient to a Kshatriya. He wants to do it, but he's inconvenient. What are you doing? Very inconvenient truths. You go to Vena, for example. Anga and Vena. What do the Brahmanas do? The first thing they come, talk to Vena, very inconvenient truth. You are not the Lord. And Vena goes, wait a minute. What? How dare you speak like that? Very inconvenient truth. Move on, Rishabhadev, Rahugana, first encounter, he, never, he is the king of the Sindh, right? Sindh used to be the opening of Bharata Varsha. Because any grunt that the Bharata Varsha had to take, historically, the Sindh was the province that had to take the grunt of Bharata Varsha. Even when Alexander came, the people that took the grunt was the people from Takshashila. They were the mouth. So Rahugana is the he is the, you, you cannot get more Kshatriya than these people. You cannot get more Kshatriya than King Rahugana. It doesn't work like he's the mouth, he's at the gate of the Bharata Varsha, stopping every 
are there many people trying to come and pollute? And what did Rishabhadeva say? You are talking rubbish. You are talking rubbish. You have no clue what you are talking about. You might be a king now. Other times you might be a servant. I might be a servant now. Other times I might be a king. Remember, because Janabharat was actually a king in his previous life. Rahugana was just a little province, Sindh. But Janabharat was actually the king of a whole province. So he says very tactfully, you could be a king now, I could be a slave, I could be a king and you could be a slave. You, what you're talking is just rubbish. What is this talk you're talking about? It's rubbish. Very inconvenient truth. Go to Prahlad Maharaj, the first time his teachers come. They're talking about Shama, Dana, you know, Shama, Danda, Bheda, they're trying to explain. Says this is rubbish. Hey, what I'm trying to establish, Shura Sena, the Brahmana comes in front of Krishna, sitting in the palace, in front of Krishna, in front of Uttava, the majestic king of the Yadus is sitting there and the Brahmana comes and says, you are a big flop. And Krishna is, uh, and people are looking at Krishna and Krishna is looking at people. Krishna <laughs> keep me out of this. And he gets away. You are a big flop. He said, why? Because my, all my children died. Oh, as if. Oh, but that is not supposed to be my fault. No, it's not like that. He says, oh, okay, let's think about this. And Arjuna was on a vacation. And Arjuna said, oh, 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 let's settle down here. Let's think about this. I, I may be able to help out here. So when you read Bhagavatam carefully, you have to read Bhagavatam very carefully. So when you read Bhagavatam carefully, self-reflectively, and also in a manner that you will be able to connect to this world, you will find some really, really, really interesting new insights in Bhagavatam. So Bhagavatam is always bringing up to surface very inconvenient truths that we may not in previous lives wanted to address. Why? Because the world in the past 50 years has been trained with this self-esteem movement that you cannot, you will be cancelled. You know the cancel culture? You understand the cancel culture? Everybody understands the cancel culture. It goes on in universities. It has been going on since 150 years. Since um, Char uh, Charles Darwin had a debate with... Uh, ah, what's it guy? in the London Royal Society. Anyway, so what they do is when you don't conform to a particular ethos, what they do is they cast you out, they ostracize you. If you don't come in, if you're not in line, if you don't speak or follow a pre-committed ethos, a pre-committed worldview, if you don't follow that, you get ostracized, you get cancelled. So what has become in the last 1500 years is Brahmanas who are supposed to be speaking inconvenient truths, what does Vidura do to Dhritarashtra? You are, you, you are a dog. Do you remember that verse? He says the life that you are living is like a dog. Bhima throws, Bhima throws his runners left over at you and you catch it like a dog and eat it. This is ridiculous. He's talking to a Kuru king. So Brahmanas are supposed to be supposed to be talking in con bringing up to surface inconvenient truths and assessing ourselves, our situations. As personally, as a society, as a community, as a nation, we are supposed to be assessing ourselves 24-7. 
That's what we are supposed to do. That's Brahmana. Not just that little thread that we have and then. Not just that. that it's not limited. That's good. It's not limited to that. That's not what I'm trying to say. So that's what Kapil Muni is trying to do. He's trying to do, he's trying to bring up some inconvenient to our predicaments. And when we were speaking in the few last few verses, he was talking about a soul who is fortunate by daivat. He uses a very technical word. He said by daivat. Daivat means by fortune. By daivat, some children in the womb of a mother clicks to them, something's wrong. Something's wrong in the system. It clicks to him. And he says, oh my God, what have I done? And he raises his, raises his heart and prays to God. Why, how did I get into this tabernacle? So those were the verses that you're seeing, that you've seen in the past. With a fortunate child, it doesn't apply to every children, remember that. For some fortunate child, by thy wath, Prabhupada puts a, puts a clear precedent. Some fortunate children, by thy wath, do that. And they understand the predicament. So we, what I'm trying to say is we need to put ourselves as a movement, as a society, as a community, as a family, as ashrams, as varnas, we should always be self-assessing ourselves 24-7. I remember this was the 50th anniversary of his call, and obviously, space dot male, uh, with no clue, no responsibility. What I was doing is I was just listening to all, everything that was available. That's what my wife thinks. Space dot male, no clue, no responsibility. <laughs> Maybe all wives think about the same, <laughs> think exactly the same about their husbands. <laughs> Space dot clueless male and irresponsible. So I was listening to all the lectures in the whole planet. I just, I just did that for weeks. First lecture I heard was Atman and Prabhu's, I remember. It just hit me like a thunderbolt. He was here, I think, on 50th anniversary, and he was doing a lecture. First time, I heard, he, he looked at the audience and he said, I consider myself a big flop. I was supposed to do something for this city, but I failed. That's the first time I heard, I heard hundreds of lectures. Hundreds of, around the whole world, you name it, like LA, Las Vegas, Russia, everywhere. And Atmaram Prabhu, he said something, he hit me like a thunderbolt. It's like, wow, I am a big flop. I was supposed to do something for this city, but I failed. And he looked at other people with his, his own friends and I don't remember if it was in the temple or he was doing somewhere else. And he looked at his other friends and said, don't you agree? And everyone was like... And it hit me like a thunderbolt. I thought, oh my God. So, okay, so is that what Brahman is supposed to do? So we have to put ourselves into a into a testing, assessing situation all the time. What am I doing? How will this help? Should I change? Should I change? How should I improve myself? What is that thing that bothering me? What is that thing that stops me from progressing in my bhakti? Let's, let, let, let me face it. Let me come to it face to face today. Let me come to it face to face. Well, I don't want to escape it. No. No. What is it? Drugs? Sex? Envy? Gramya Katha? 
indulgence, money. Face it. Let's face this. Fanaticism, that's another problem in spiritual life. Am I becoming a fanatic? We have to think about these things. We have to assess. There has to be some kind of measure where you go up. So, okay, too much philosophy. Too much, too much serious. Okay, let's lighten this up a little bit. Yeah, let's lighten this up. So, Sankirtan story? You like Sankirtan story? Sankir yeah, we have a few Sankirtan stories. People here, so Sankirtan story. So, one day, um, I was uh, doing books and um, I was uh, a devotee, a devotee child was walking just past. Born as a devotee, raised as a devotee, grown up as a devotee, and everything devotee around him. I meet them all the time. When I'm Sankirtan, they're passing. Sometimes even when I, when I go to this, uh, what do you call this? Stayovers, and children stay over and things like you do that with your friends. What is that? Sleepovers, yeah? Yeah, so sometimes when my daughters, like, they want to go to their friends' places and sleepovers and all to get together, so I go with them and I'm talking to devotee children. And one day I was on the street and this was, this devotee child had come, I, I, this was maybe sixth after I had already met five, which gave me the same thing. And this was, like, finally, another sixth one, finally. And, you know, after they, they're crossing the teenagers, they know how to catch buses, they know how to catch trains, they know how to make their way to the schools and things like that. So I'm meeting them and I strike up a conversation. All the time I'm meeting them, I strike up a conversation. So and I say, how, how is your, um, your Krishna conscious going? How is your life going? I said, in, I said how, how is your life going? And he turned to me and said, boring. And this was six guys who gave me the same answer. What do you mean boring? Just boring? Why? Okay, I said, okay, don't embarrass him. Next question, how's your Krishna consciousness going? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, my parents do, so yeah, we really go along like that. So how's your Bhagavatam going? I have no idea what it is, what they talk about it in there. Really? So, uh, this, is, this is going to be confronting now. This is going to be confronting, okay? Disclaimer. Yeah, confronting, but, but just, just stay with me and make sense of all this. I actually met two children after being like that, two devoted children, after being like that. They came to a point where they actually wanted to give up their lives. I said to you, it's going to be confronting. And their parents called me and said, could you go and have a little chat? One of them is, uh, wants to jump over the bridge or something like that. And the other one said something else. So I wanted to go and chat and I just thought, okay, yeah, we need to talk. So one of them, I, one of them was, a, was a female, so I was a bit soft and I tried to explain. Well, I was trying to understand what is the reason. The reason is because whatever, since they're born, whatever they've seen as a devotee in their life, they were never able to use it and relate it in their personal lives in schools and universities and work. They cannot put, it's like putting a round peg in a square hole. It's for them, it's like putting a round peg in a square hole. It doesn't fit. And it, like, it doesn't, and then she, 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 they, they couldn't make sense of how to, how to put Bhagavatam in perspective in their personal lives. And then she was just about, she was just, I'm, 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 if I finish up, I'm fine this tonight. And I met, after some time, I met another boy and he said the same thing and this time I used reverse psychology I said okay go jump and this oh really is that what you say yeah jump no I don't want to do it yeah sure come on let's jump so we, we went and we had a chat and 
But anyway, fortunately, they're all devotees now. They're all doing very well in their lives and all that. But what I'm trying to say is, we have to think about our children. We have to think about ourselves. We have to think about our communities. We have to assess how we are doing. Yeah? So, that was kind of an introduction that I wanted to give. Because that's what Pro Kapila Muni is doing throughout his... Um, spiel, speech. He's critically analyzing the tattvas. Kati tattvani. Devoti asks specific words. Kati tattvani santi. Please tell me all the categories of different categories of different ontologies. Kati tattvani. Then he goes into this. And finally he's giving us a, what's called an inconvenient truth. Yeah? So now you want to now before you start going for refunds and say Radhika Prasad never talks about the words. I'll talk about the words a little bit. So these kind of elements in the scriptures where a saint or a saintly person or an incarnation is talking about suffering of human beings and us in general falls into a category called Problem of evil, also called theodicy. So, uh, so, without any extra cost, we have a special going on this long weekend. I'm going to explain to you what that is. So, these kind of topics. They, they fall into a category in the outside world, it, they fall into a category called problem of evil. And what was the second term I used? Theodicy. Okay. You always get my prasad, I'll really give someone else. So, theodicy. Theodicy, I'll explain to you. Just relax. Theodicy means God. Philosophically, he means triple O. You got your pens and notes and everything? So God is called a triple O God. Omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent. Present is different, is also there, but in the triple O, you're right. But in the triple O comes these three categories. When they call God a triple O God, Omniscient means who knows everything. Omnipotent means he has a full ability to control and do nice things. Omnibenevolent benevolent is the most kindest and what he does is all good. So they call God a triple O God in philosophy. So now the problem of evil or theodicy in Greek theo means God and decay is justice. So justice. So what they're trying to talk about is if God is omniscient, He knows everything. He knows your suffering. He knows your suffering. He knows your suffering. And He has the ability, omnipotent. He has the practical ability to do that. He has the Shakti, Antaranga and Dhairanga. But, and, benevolent is kind. But why is there so much suffering in the world? This is an extremely hard topic now. In the Chatswood, uh, we did a fair. We were there was this guy that came to meet uh, my daughter. He was just absolutely thumping her down. What is your explanation as Hare Krishna's? Tell me, tell me, tell me. And she was like, was like, and I was talking with someone else, and she came running to me and dad, dad, we, we, I've got a problem. And I said, Mira, I'm talking. And she goes, No, this is more important. I said, like, I'm talking. And the guy who was just talking said, No, no, no. It looks like she needs help. I'll wait. So I finally went and he said, Tell me what your answer is. Problem of evil. Why are babies suffering? Why do we suffer when God is all potent, all benevolent, all knowing? Why should we suffer in this world? And the guy looked at me, Oh, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, Karma. Hey, 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 hey. Keep your judgments to yourself. <laughs> wait a minute. What do you do? No, 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 relax, relax. So he said, that's the problem with you Indians. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
Why? So that's what you give us. Indians, you say problem, you say you're suffering because why? Your karma. End of story. Close the chapter, move on. No, no, no. Krishna never said, never ever said in Mahabharata, it's your karma. When Draupadi was suffering, he never said it's your karma. When Kunti was suffering, he never said it's your karma. When Arjuna was suffering, he never said it's your karma. When Bhishma was suffering, he never said your karma. He actually tried to deal with technical philosophical problems. He never said this is your karma. So the problem of evil, we have every religious institution has 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 to deal with problem of evil. Why is there so much suffering in this world when God is all omni omniscient? Second, third, benevolent. So only benevolent. If God is kind, if God is, can do everything, why is there so much suffering? Do you want me to discuss on this matter? You just never put more coins in the meter. <laughs> so this is long. This is long weekend. So every, everything. The boss is going bananas. Everything is on sale. The boss is going bananas. <laughs> everything is on sale today. So everything is on sale. So the, uh, with no for no extra charge, I'm going to give you. I'm going to. I'm going. I, I don't give you. I'm not going to give you an answer. But I'm happy to discuss. Yeah. So one of the major, major philosophical changes happened in this discussion is by an extremely important person still living. His name is Alvin Plantinga. He's from the US. Um, he's an emeritus professor now, still works uh, in various um, Illinois, uh, so many other universities. Alvin Plantinga, he's done some real major work. So what he explains is he's, he's called it good. He's called is free will defense. He calls it what's called free will defense. He says to be able to allow some kind of free will and an amount of free will for you to be able to function, to be able to use your motivations and intentions to to function your free will to allow your free will. There has to be some. There has to be little evil in this planet. And he calls it a free will defense. What does he call? Free will defense. And the name of this person, very important, very important. His name is Alvin Plantinga. I have a very high respect for him. He's very fanatical Christian. He's very, very, very strong, staunch Christian. I have a lot of respect for him because he's amazing. He's done a lot of work. So it's called free will defense. So he say, what he's saying is, for, for, for the amount of free will that has to function, there has to be so much punishment and evil and pain that has to be, so that the free will can be placed in balance. That is, it sounds reasonable. Karma, let's go back to karma, we can't completely ignore karma. Come on. Karma is a logical explanation. Logically, it sounds okay, because Newton also, Newton said every action has to have a equal and opposite reactions, so it logically sounds okay. So karma can also be placed on that back basket. So we place karma on this basket. We placed free will defense on this basket. So now I'm going to give you a few more um, solutions from problem of evil from Vedanta perspective, from Vedic perspective. From the Vedic perspective, the problem of evil is why are you actually go it's called evidential problem why are you actually going through this problem now what is the evidence for it there's no evidence this is the problem there's no evidence because what because your karma has been wiped out you don't remember anything do you remember anything from your past life Anybody here? Any mistakes? Any mistakes? You can't remember. We don't remember. That was my problem. That was my contention with my mother. I used to say, Mother, karma, don't talk about it. Why? Because I don't remember. There is no evidence for it. 
But, but, there is an evidence. Just like when you are in a hospital, you may not remember what happened to you through your surgical procedure, you may not remember what they did through your surgical procedure. But when you look at your band, and then you look at your cannula, cannula, they call it cannula, don't they? Cannula, yeah, cannula. They put it in your, there's a little needle, and then they have a band. You don't know what is your procedure, but that band will always tell you, the cannula will always tell you the procedure that you've been through. In the same way, you may not remember your karma, but the propensity to sin, the propensity, the papa buddhi, the papa buddhi is your band around your wrist. That's your cannula. All the karma that has accumulated has been put into a little chip called papa buddhi and it stays in your mind as a propensity to sin at the first blind spot opportunity. So you may not remember your karma, you may not remember your past deed, but it stays as a canola, it stays as a band, as a chip called Papa Buddhi, to commit to err at the first blind spot opportunity. Nobody is watching. That's, evidential. That, that's the evidential problem. So then there is another problem. So what, is, what did we go through? We've gone through karma, we've gone through? Very good. Three? Three? Evidential problem. Good, good, good. So finally it's called phenomenological problem. Phenomenological problem. Why is there so much suffering? It's called phenomenological problem. The amount is incomprehensible. People get away. Mao got away. Mao and the Cambodian killings and the Mao and all the communist killings are 10 times more, 50 times more than what Hitler did. Did you know that? And then Stalin dies in his sleep peacefully. Wait, 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 wait. It's peacefully in his sleep after a couple of shots of vodka. Now we have phenomenological How? Why is there so much suffering? One, you don't have evidence. Two, why is there so much? We don't know. So this is what these kind of discussions, when we talk about suffering of people, this is where these discussions are going. So the Bhagavatam point of view is first, let's go to quickly, God. So much to say, so little time. Okay, I quickly do. So from Vedantic perspective, they say, you might have heard this, Buddha said, Buddha is supposed to have said that, that when you are shot by an arrow, don't worry about where the arrow came from, worry about quickly fixing the wound. Have you heard this before? Even Bhakti Maharaj, a lot of our Maharaj also state that. Why did I fall to this material world? So don't worry about how you sin, don't worry about that, how you sin in the spiritual world. Worry about how to work back now. That's the, that's the kind of solution given to us. So Buddha apparently is supposed to have said, said that don't worry about where the arrow came from. Uh, just worry about how to heal your wound. Uh, I beg pardon, I worry about both, personally. So, so where, where, where is this suffering coming from? The, the pro, let's go to the solutions that Bhagavatam gives. The Bhagavatam, the Vedic understanding of the problem of evil, is not solution. It's not solving the problem of evil. It's resolving the solo, problem of evil. It's not solving the problem of evil, it's resolving the problem of evil. Do you understand the difference? Do you want me to explain? I'll explain. So solving is giving a blanket rule for everybody and throwing it on people without personal considerations. But resolving is a personal thing. 
you tailor, you listen to people. For example, Kunti, how does she resolve the problem of evil? She says, Vipada Santu Teshashwat Tatra Tatra Jagat Guru Bhoto Darshanam Yatsya. What is her resolve? What is her resolve? She says, Give me more troubles. That's her resolve. Because every time I have more problem, it happens to be that you are around. So give me more resolve. How does Bhishma Deva handle the problem of evil? When Yudhisthira says, Yudhisthira comes and I can't handle this carnage. This is sinful. I won't be able to take this burden of sin. I am suffering. What does Bhishma Deva, what does Bhishma Deva say? You solve your problem of evil, you solve your pain by helping others remove their pain. This is a completely different solution. Kunti Devi is saying, give me more pain. Bhishma Devi is saying, the only way you can address your pain is by helping others address their pain. This is a completely different solution. What is, let's go to Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj is suffering. He's been kicked out by his stepmother. He's burning with anger. He's bubbling with courage. What does his mother say? The only solution to your problem, son, is Vishnu. You resolve yourself and go and pray to Vishnu, he is the only one who can solve your problems. It's completely different. What does Rushabhadi give to his sons? He says, Tapo Divyam Putra Kahina Sattam Your problem, your solution for your problem of evil is Tapo Divyam. Do Divya Tapas, Bhakti Yoga. What does Rutras, how does Rutrasura deal with this problem of evil? He has been chopped, he has been chopped at four parts of his body. Do you remember how Rutrasura was dying? He was practically getting butchered. It's like, it's like portable arbit, uh, um, avatar. That Vajra, either, it's like the, the weapon of Vajra, it's like a portable amateur. It's like a moving butcher shop. He's getting butchered. What does he say? If, if, if Nara and Astra, if Vishnu is coming to you, he's put you against me, why should I worry? Bring it on. Come on, pick up that sword. Come on, pick up that sword. He chomps, he's like, he's fallen and he says, get it up. Come on. That's how I deal with my problem of evil. My problem, the way I deal with my problem of evil is I'm going to face it. Why should I, conf why should I confront it? Why should I not confront it if it's sent by Vishnu? How does Prahlad Maharaj deal with problem of evil? Naivod vijay paraduratte vaitaranya tadvirya gari namhamrita chitta so, Cheta to, Namuka Cheta Indriyatha. Maya Sukhaya Bharamudvate Vimodhavan. I am not worried about my suffering. I am worried about the sufferings of these fools and rascals. Prayera Deva Munayo Swabhimutti Kama Maunam Charanti Vijane Navarartha Nishtha Why Nanyam Tadasya Sharanam Brahmata Anupashya? He says, I am not going to run away. Prayera Deva Munayo Swabhimutti Kama Mostly what I see is saintly people are afraid of this problem, afraid of these sufferings these pains and they run away. Prahena Deva Muneya Mukti Kama. What do they want to do? They want their personal liberation. Maudam Charanti Vijane Sopara Nishtha. They don't worry about others. 
But me, but me, but me. I am worried about these fools and rascals. Why? Nanyam Tadasya Sharanam Brahmdana Pashe. I have seen everywhere. I have gone to the top universities. My dad, by the way, runs the most Ivy League elite universities on this, in this universe. Just in case you guys didn't know. Pralana is saying, just in case you guys didn't have it to know, my father runs the most Ivy school, most top Ivy League elite universities on the planet. I've been there. Nanyam to the Sisharanam Pramadana Pashe, but I can't see any protection. So you have every single character that's dealing with problem of evil in a very different way. That is the reason it's not solving the problem of evil, it is resolving the problem of evil. It is a personalized thing. You can't throw a blanket rule on people. The day you throw a blanket, of blanket rule on people is the day that spiritual moon. It is the beginning of an end of a spiritual movement. If you haven't written anything this down, write this down. The day you throw blanket rules on people for their suffering, karma, that, this, that, no. Resolving, it's a personalized tailored solution. So this is what Prahlad Maharaj is saying. Prayera Deva Munaya Swabhi Mukti Kama Maunam Charanthi Jane Na Paratha Nishta So I am not going to leave these fools and rascals. I am going to work for them. So that's what we are here to do. We are not here to throw judgments at people. We are not here to throw karmi, kaliuga, jagans at people. We are here to find common grounds with these whatever people they are out there. The beautiful names that we have given them. Karmis or kaliugas or mayas or whatever. These beautiful names that we have given them. No. We are here to find common grounds. We are here to help resolve this problem of evil, these sufferings. Then you become a spiritual movement. Then you got something. Then you give something. Then you can part. Then it is a participation. Then it is not telling people what to do. Then it is a participation of a beautiful divine Varnashrama system. You locate yourself in the society, you locate your spot, you locate other spot, you understand your psychophysical natures, you understand the divine Varnashrama system, you engage good, healthy dialogues with people, you help people resolve this problem of evil because there is too much suffering. Just in case you haven't heard the news. That's what these topics are leading to. It's called problem of evil theodicy. Because God is supposed to be omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, but there's so much problem. So, first we discuss free will defense. Then we discuss karma. Good. Then we discuss evidential problem. Good, good. You share your mother's And then we discuss finally phenomenological problem. Why is there so much? Then we discuss how various characters in Bhagavatam have dealt with their problems of evils and sufferings. How did Ranti Deva deal with his suffering? Even you go to the Bible, Job, how did he deal with his suffering? How did Ecclesiastic deal with suffering? How did Prophet Muhammad deal with suffering? Any sect, how did Prabhupada deal with suffering? What did Prabhupada say? Prabhupada has a very, very unique, interesting twist to problem of suffering. It's classic. Anybody remember? 
Prabhupada is a classic. Prabhupada says, what do you expect? You're in an ocean, you're going to get wet. You're in an ocean, man. You are going to get wet, so what do you expect? Material life is, devotional life is hard, material life is impossible. You are in a suffering world, you are in an ocean, you are going to get wet. What do you expect? This is Prabhupada's unique way. So we hear all these. We have, we develop this broad perspective and we relate to this world. We are here to help this planet. We make children, sense gratification is overrated. Sex is not for sense, sensual gratification. We bring good progeny into this world. That can make proportionate, that can contribute a proportionate, valuable ethics, valuable behavior into the world. So there is a collective, dynamical change to the behavioral pattern of the whole planet. Every single person adds. Do you want me to tell you something interesting? Because I've been feeling so depressing today. I'm sure you got some aspirin. Hopefully. I've been talking so depressing and my class might make you feel so depressed or something. I'll say then something uplift you. Make, make your long weekend, yeah? You want to say something? Make your long weekend, uplift you, like, you know? The psychology sessions are only for 30 minutes, but this is no extra charge. You are Krishna story, God story will never be complete without mentioning you. God story will never be full complete without mentioning you. Do you want me to give you a scriptural proof? Mamai Vamsho Jiva Loka Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. Every single living being is a part of me. If you are part of God, how can God's story be complete without mentioning you? Without mentioning you? Without mentioning you? Can you believe this? You are part of God's story. Does it make your day? It's classic. So we have God here. Just five minutes and then you can. So yeah, this is God's story. You are part of God's story. And God's story will never be complete without mentioning you. 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 So we are parts of God. So we have to become these images, these emblems, these images, resemblance, representations of God's love on this planet. You want to do that? We have a nice book called Bhagavad Gita. Please get one on your way back home. Yeah? So, read a little bit. Four pages a day. Okay, discount. Three pages a day. Long weekend discount. Yeah? Three pages a day. Yeah? Someone asked me, what's the best time to read Gita? I said, check your breath. The breath is working, read Gita. So, become representatives of God on this planet. Is, does it sound like a good plan? Beautiful, isn't it? The most romantic thing you've ever heard in your life becomes representatives of God's love on this planet. Who wants to do that? Wow. Looks like I've done something right today. Okay, so I just want to, before um, you start, um, any questions or any... Um, I'm, I'm, I just want to first thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody for coming. Because uh, I can understand I can be a little painful. My talks can be, I know, I know, okay. I don't, don't think I don't know, okay. I know my talks can be very painful. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 I'll start su supplying some free aspirins next time I come, okay. 
don't ever think that I don't understand. I do. I understand your suffering. I understand your problem of pain. <laughs> so don't. So which is I. I really want to thank you. Okay, I will never take you for granted. I promise this. I'll never take you for granted. This is my promise. Never take you for granted. Okay. Thanks for coming. If you have any comments or questions, we're going to send out a donation box, and when the donation box is full, we give the answers. No, I'm just joking. That was a joke. <laughs> so, any questions, comments, or corrections, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to be corrected, trust me. Don't go by my, you know, the bodily gymnastics. I'm very happy to be corrected. Any comments, questions? Either you're very hungry, <laughs> or you just got it. <laughs> you must, you must, when I used to think, what a stupid question, any questions? <laughs> let, let, who am I to come between you and your kitchen? One chakra put in the kitchen, two chakra put in the kitchen, and 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 two chakra put in the kitchen,